I'd like to dedicate this talk today to my grandfather because he would have loved this story. And so instead, I'll share it with you. And as I tell you the story, I'd like to invite you to ponder this question. Whose story is this? Now, our story begins with a number, 69,388. And if you're wondering what that number is, well, you might go to the internet and you might type in a search engine the number and see what type of results you get. So with that search, here's what you might find. A cobalt blue beehive lamp, ID 69388. Or this handy dandy Bosch fuel pump, item 69388. Or even a beautiful set of designs for a Southwest style house, design 69388. But our story, it isn't about any of those things. In this story, that number was given to an 18 year old girl named Anita. It's not a number she chose or even thought much about until a very, very cold morning in December of 1943. You see, Anita had been waiting in a long line with other women and girls for what was known as the welcoming ceremony at the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. There, Anita was stripped naked, her head was shaved, and a young girl was standing there before her hands trembling, lifted up a pen with a needle on the end of it. And as neatly as she could, the young girl inscribed five digits into Anita's left forearm, which began to swell and bleed. Six, nine, three, eight, eight. In the space of a few minutes, Anita said, I had been stripped of every vestige of human dignity and become indistinguishable from everyone around me. She was no longer a person. She was a number. And as far as the Nazis were concerned, that number, it told them everything that they needed to know about Anita. Her entire life story reduced to just five digits. And best of all, that number could track the living and the dead. But that number, that number wasn't Anita. It was a lie. One of the many lies of hatred and prejudice that formed anti-Semitism that brought Anita to the very gates of Auschwitz. And in today's internet, Web 2.0, many of these same lies, they continue to proliferate in a powerful web of misinformation and mistrust. The lies are recommended to you as the next video to watch or the top of a search result. Innovation has outpaced wisdom as big data and big platforms have grown so big that they've overwhelmed the truth. And left unchecked, well, tomorrow the web could be filled with even more lies. Imagine what that might look like for a minute. Deep fake videos in which Holocaust survivors' words and their likeness are manipulated to prove that somehow the Holocaust never happened. That could be our future. So what are we going to do about that? Looking at the alternatives, it's at once inspiring and also daunting. You see, the internet is evolving at a breakneck speed right before our eyes. And you may have heard about all the buzz about technologies like blockchains or Bitcoin or NFTs. Together, they're part of a larger set of technologies that are really trying to reshape and improve the internet as we know it into what people are calling the decentralized web, moving us from web 2.0 of today to web three. At my lab at Stanford and the USC Shoah Foundation, we are working with technologists, historians, journalists, and lawyers to seize this opportunity to leverage and shape web three. There's a lot to do, but we believe that there's a clear and an intuitive and attainable starting point. Use Web3 to preserve the integrity of the world's most sensitive and vulnerable data. We're starting with 55,000 testimonies from those who have survived genocide. These testimonies bear witness from survivors of the Holocaust in 13 additional genocide collections spanning Armenia, Cambodia, Rwanda, 
And they also look at mass atrocities unfolding today in Myanmar and Ukraine. As we speak, we are in the process of uploading the full four petabytes of this archive onto the decentralized internet. It's a new kind of backup. And from what had been stored in just three locations, well, now we're putting an additional backup copy on the archive onto hundreds of servers, and soon thousands, all on the next version of the internet. This effort is the largest ingestion of data onto the D-Web in the world. And the first testimony that is on the D-Web, well, it's from Anita. Over two hours of her telling her story, we take Anita's testimony, and we chop it up into thousands of little pieces, and then we distribute those to servers all over the world. And as we distribute the files, we use math to prove that even though the pieces are out of our control, they haven't been changed, they haven't been tampered with, that they remain authentic. Now, the way we mark this authenticity is by assigning Anita's video a unique number. It's a unique seal, a unique stamp of the video's authenticity. Tamper with the video, the seal is broken. But from what authority do we trust to generate this stamp of authenticity? What authority ensures that this number is unique? Well, we could take the stamp from a centralized authority, like, say, how the Nazi government centrally defined the number that was tattooed on Anita's arm. And well, that, surely that doesn't seem right. Instead, we use a different type of number. It's one that is intrinsically authentic and unique because it's actually derived from Anita herself. It's from her voice. What we do is we take every bit of data from Anita's video and we pass it through a one-way algorithm. This results in a unique, persistent number. It's a hash, but not just a regular hash. It's a content ID that is optimized so that you have a resilient identifier that represents each file, no matter where it lives. And you don't need Google to find it, or Amazon to host it, or Facebook to share it. Well, that number, it can endure all on its own without any company. And with a CID on the D-Web, you'll always be able to find Anita's exact testimony, plus you'll have a record of its origin, its authenticity, and therefore its wisdom is intact. For Anita's video has a universe of wisdom and answers so many of the questions that we have about her and her experience. Like for instance, what was she before she came to Auschwitz? In fact, that's the very question that she was asked right after being given her tattoo. The girl processing her registration casually asked Anita, what did you do before the war? Without thinking, Anita answered, I was a cellist. You must wait here, the girl says. So Anita stands there, naked, holding just a toothbrush. And looking up, she sees the showers overhead. And as the room empties out, she's suddenly alone and she's heard the rumors about the gas chambers. And so she thinks to herself, well, this is it. But after a few minutes, the girl returns with a surprisingly well-dressed prisoner who begins peppering Anita with all sorts of different questions, all of them about the cello. This prisoner is the conductor of the Women's Orchestra of Auschwitz, and the orchestra needs a cellist. Several days later, an SS guard arrives to take Anita to an audition, and he doesn't ask for a prisoner 69388. Bring me the cellist, he asks instead. And then, for the first time in two years, Anita holds a cello in her hands. And it takes a minute for her fingers to reacquaint themselves with the strings. And she starts her audition by playing this piece, the Adagio of Boccherini's Cello Concerto No. 9. Anita would play with the orchestra each morning for thousands of inmates marching to work and to their death. She would play for officers like Joseph Mengele and the Angel of Death, 
who personally demanded for Anita's solo. This piece, it helped her survive the inferno, and miraculously, it helped Anita also save the life of her sister, who arrived at Auschwitz just a few weeks later. Think about it, just this piece has saved lives. As Anita said, Hitler destroyed so much, but music, music is indestructible. At the lab, we were so moved by these words, and soon they became not just an article of faith, but a roadmap for our next prototype. If you go to starlinglab.org slash Anita, you'll find a file that you can download. It's this rendition of Anita's audition piece, as played by Yo-Yo Ma. It's his gift to you, a musical tribute to Anita's incredible story. Working with Yo-Yo Ma and his team, we looked at this recording and we really we reimagined it as a vessel. Already, it contains through the language of music Anita's experience, but now there's something else. In the header of each music file, we embedded the content ID of Anita's video testimony. Remember, that's that unique number that preserves her video on Web3. And that might seem like the most unlikely place to store a CID, but actually it's the safest because of who downloads it and why. At the beginning of this talk, I asked you, whose story is this? And well, surely it's Anita's, but by downloading this prototype file, now it's your story. And it's your story and your story. It's our story. Each of us and all of us, we now hold Anita's precious number, her CID. We are the keepers of the authenticity of her testimony, and therefore we are now all part of Web3. Download the file, and you become a node on the Web3 internet. And we have everything that we need. And that's what most people miss. When they think about the decentralized web, they focus on the network and all the trustless connections within it. But for me, they always start with the nodes themselves and the hashes that they create. I see them for what they are. Not a number in a crypto wallet, not a record of a transaction in a DAO, or the number that represents an NFT. At its core, a hash on Web3 is the expression of humans. And I believe that the new web will only truly begin when we bring the sense of purpose and humanity. Not unbridled optimism, not quick fixes, but look, don't take my word for it. Take it from Anita. She's 96 years old. She's alive and well. Her story is now part of the foundation of the decentralized web. And as she said, it's not about numbers. It's about people. It's important that people identify with people when we talk about the Holocaust because I always feel this idea of six million dead people is, uh, is totally futile, nobody can, there's no concept of that. But the generation that come after us, if they talk about the Holocaust and just think of six million people, it becomes a dead, dead uh, territory. And I think these interviews are important for the people to see that we were actually people and totally normal people and nothing, nothing wrong with us coming from totally normal families, being reduced to what we were reduced to, which led to, the, uh, to this uh, unprecedented uh, mass murder that, uh, that the Holocaust is.